All right, folks, welcome back. Now we're talking about the last aspect of creativity we're going to talk about today, which is collaboration, analysis, and the power of creative artifacts, computational artifacts. Okay? So now we're talking about the process of making something creatively. And many people think that, look, all the brilliant geniuses that have made things make them alone in a basement or in a garage. We're near Silicon Valley in a garage. Not the case at all. So many people during the process have collaboration where they're working together to make that artifact. They're working together to make that new innovation. It's very rare, really is very rare, that from start to finish, someone did it all on their own. It's just so hard these days with all of the possibilities that other aspects, other diverse opinions might, might benefit, that someone would think the only one opinion and that thing taken from start to finish is better to have one person's opinion. Now, sometimes there's a leader who has their drive, you know, the, the founder might have their vision for how it works, but they still have collaborators all throughout that help influence and shape and polish. You can think of collaborators in some sense as people who all have a little bit of very fine, uh, abrasive sandpaper. And each one of them is kind of helping polish your sculpture in different angles. I'm really good at knees, so I'm going to go over and like polish. Oh, now the knees are perfect, now, thanks to my. So each person has their little angle on what they're great they can polish. Maybe I'm really good at, oh, this might work for one group of students, but not other group of students. So I'm really good about thinking about a lot of diverse group of students that a particular software might work for. So it's really great to have collaborative influences to the process. So collaboration is first, just definition, very simple. Work in, pro in the building of something that's more than one person, okay, not just one individual. Here's the interesting thing. Effective collaboration, now that we have the internet, we're going to learn a lot about the internet later in the semester, the power is in these online collaborative tools. There's a ton of tools out there that are free, often free, that'll let you work collaboratively when you're not in the same place. So now we've bought into the idea that collaboration can help. We'll talk a little bit more later. But how do you make it happen if you're not in the same place? And there's amazing tools that'll, right now, free, allow people to both have conferencing. So, you know, here's my, I can just, in the boring, here's a picture of my sketch, and then you're looking and saying, well, I might add a little thing here, the bridge, and make, stretch it here, maybe have a bike lane. Okay, so we're talking online. You can also have documents that you're working on together. Most of you have done this before. If you haven't, I encourage you to try this. Google Docs is a great start because it's all free. So you and a, and a partner, or maybe multiple partners, are working on together a presentation, or you're making, you're writing an essay, or you're, Writing a grant proposal, this is very common, where many of us are trying to get money from agencies to teach stuff and to do interesting, innovative things in computer science education, and we're collaboratively working on these grants together. There's 10 people all in the same document, all polishing in their way, which is really fun to watch who's good at the which versus that, who's good at capitalization, who's good at the flow, who's good at, wait, I don't get that from 10 miles up, the whole, I'm not getting the message, you know, who's good at different people? Each of us is adding our different aspect in that collaboration, it's wonderful. It can also be hard. It's not always easy, right? It could be that I have a vision for taking the, the essay or the picture or the sculpture this way, and one of my collaborators wants to take it this way, and there's a tug of war, and that's always a tension, and that's always hard. So it's not always easy, but sometimes you end up coming that watch. I think it should be A, you think it should be B. It turns out after thinking about it, it turns out that C makes us all happy is better than A or B. Sometimes you go to a better place where it's a win-win, where it's actually better thanks to each of you, and it doesn't have to be only A or B, which is an important thing. So in terms of the process, I just mentioned, I just kind of was waxing about the tension. One of the bullet three says effective collaboration, practice a couple of things. Interpersonal communication, consensus building. So it's trying to get everybody in the same team with that. Conflict resolution. How do you work successfully collaboratively? Well, when you have conflict, you have to have, figure out how to resolve the conflict and how to have all the voices heard and how to have not just the loudest person win. Right? If, I, if you had no training in how to work in a team successfully, you may have, by default, the loudest, strongest, biggest person wins, or the person with the most money, or the most influence. All those are the wrong thing. The right thing for a successful collaboration is when all the voices are heard and you come up to consensus where everyone feels like that's the right decision together. And as I said, sometimes it isn't A or B, sometimes actually it's a C that you didn't think about. And so kind of exploring all the spaces is important as well. Okay? Negotiation. All right, maybe I'll give you one, I'll give a little bit on this one, but you give me on this one so we're both kind of happy at the end and so everybody feels like they've not just lost every decision. Okay, that's important too. So effective, effective collaboration strategies enhances performance. The team is better. If the team does these successful collaboration, the team will be more successful. The output will be better. Okay? Um, 
multiple perspectives. So another piece of it is one of the reasons that the diverse perspectives are so wonderful is a single group. There might be five people, but if you don't have a diverse kind of group of folks influencing the design, you may only have things that are appealing to a certain group. You might have a certain group where they're from, what they're like, demographics, all those things factor in, but you need to have diversity on many opinions. Otherwise, you kind of don't have, oh, we didn't think about because nobody on our team has that, right? I didn't think about, I'm quite tall myself, so let's say I had a team of all people who were really, really tall. We don't think about what happens if you're much taller than me or much shorter than me because we're all the same height or something like that. So you want to think of having a diverse opinion of many different angles, okay? And finally, you want to be able to, again, have that personal, that personal connection to the creativity reflected in the collaborative design. It's an important thing. Now, once you've built your collaborative artifact, your, your computational artifact collaboratively or non-collaboratively, you can do analysis of it. So you've built something. Here it is. It's in my hand. Well, you can look at it from different lenses, okay? How effective is it at solving a problem? The problem you were asked to, it was asked to solve. How effective is it at sharing the vision? Let's say it's a story. Let's say this is a story for the next Pixar film. And they collaboratively work together using computational tools like, you know, online authoring, Google Docsy things to make something. Well, you can now have an angle. How does that story sound? How does it make you feel? Okay? So the computational artifact, the thing created with a computer, can have an analysis that has many different lenses to it. So you can look at it with correctness. Does it solve the problem? Is it useful? Usability? Okay? How, what's this functionality? This piece of software is really hard to use. You have to like, put all these arguments in. Is it the lines? It's too hard to find. The usability can be a, a lot of different angles to it. Okay? And suitability. Does it actually work? in terms of being suited for what the task you're going to be using it for. This is kind of a general thing because it's a lot of, it depends on the particular artifact you're thinking about. It might have weaknesses, right? I might, I might have to, here's a picture, here's a picture. I had these, I had these uh, screws to put in, and I make this computational artifact, and I build this amazing hammer. It's not the right tool, right? So it might not have the right, the, it might have weaknesses. Well, it's nice if I really want to, squash the wood, but it doesn't really kind of grip, and it threads the wood with the screw. It's, hard to, it's harder than a nail, so that didn't work. So it might have some weaknesses, have some mistakes and errors. Those mistakes and errors may not be seen. How about this one? It may have mistakes that are actually not visible. So I might have something that renders a picture, and in the bottom right corner, it actually draws a really evil looking face, like a but it's really subtle. It's really subtle. So nobody can see it, but it's still bad. My software had a bug, and it draws a really mean, angry face. But most of people can't see it, even though it has kind of an error, that face wasn't supposed to be there. I could make a, an audio software that actually randomly generates music. And I generate, so I say, like, I program it, make a riff like Jimi Hendrix guitar riff. And right, if you zoom in, it actually goes really high frequency. But no one can hear that because our audio operates in this 20 hertz, 20 kilohertz thing. But in fact, it shouldn't be wiggling. It should be flat during the quiet period, but it's not. It's not flat. It has noise, but no one's hearing it because our ears don't work like that. It's still an error, but you can't see it based on your perception. Okay? And finally, here's the piece of part of it. The functionality, I talked about how functional is this, is, or appropriateness, okay, depends on how it's used or perceived. So what, in some sense, what that means is, I think, uh, this, is, this is a harder one to get to right here. But in some sense, it says, I'm thinking this is going to be used for that technique. Turns out it's really supposed to be meant for that one. So I'm deciding it's not appropriate, because I think it's being used for the wrong thing. It's supposed to be used for that. So I think, OK, you make, I don't know what the tool is, but you make this great thing. It looks like a, it's really a hammer. But it looks like this weird thing with a metal part and a stick. Boy, that must be used for screws, because they kind of have a round head, and they're supposed to go into wood. So I'm going to say, that's inappropriate for driving things into wood because I'm having the wrong context for it. It's great as a tool. Every, every, every carpenter has a hammer. But I'm, because the perception of kind of the context of what I was going to use that artifact for was the wrong one, I'm evaluating it as a very poor functionality. In fact, that's great functionality for what it's meant to do. But I'm thinking about it in the wrong context. Okay, So that's what the bottom one says. <laughs>